Thank you. Um, so the purpose of my study was to identify reoccurring motifs within the chrism ritual of the first four centuries of, the, of early Christian history. Um, the chrism essentially is an oil anointing uh, with which we're familiar in, the, in our doctrine also with uh, anointing of the sick and in, uh, in temple capacity. Um, I did this in an effort to establish some sort of uni uniform doctrinal view concerning the significance of the ritual, uh, for example, what it meant and uh, why it was performed. Um, charisma um, is translated as anointing or unction. This is supposed to be in Greek, actually. Uh, cheo, it comes from the verb cheo, meaning to anoint, rub, or touch on the surface, um, from which we get our English word Christ, uh, Christos, meaning anointed one. Uh, the Hebrew equivalent for the anointed one is uh, Mashiach, coming from Mashach, and which we translate Messiah. Um, three components uh, that I'm going to talk about today are first, a literal anointing, second, a symbol for the reception of the Holy Spirit, and third, an endowment of knowledge and power. Um, according to early Christian writers and the Apostle John, um, it seems that the early Christians saw um, the root of the ritual chrism, chrism uh, in early Israelite cultic practice. Um, early Early Israelite anointing was performed by a prophet, king, or high priest. The high priest was anointed by pouring oil on the head, while the priest family as a whole is anointed by splashing oil on man and garments together. The ritual was performed in order to give power or majesty, enthrone, sanctify, or set apart, to prepare an individual or object to enter in the presence of God, to endow with the quality of deity, and to establish and finalize office and vocation. Those who were anointed would one day become kings, high priests, or would be preparing to enter symbolically or literally into the presence of God, uh, for example, the temple. Along with the ark, table, lampstands, utensils, incense altar, main altar, and wash basin, um, Aaron, his son, Solomon, David, <coughs> and Saul were all anointed. Um, Tertullian, who was an early Christian writer in Carthage in the second, third centuries uh, AD, likewise described the chrism as a practice originating from the old discipline ever since Aaron was anointed by Moses. Uh, early Christian historian Eusebius wrote, it is not only the high priest symbolically anointed with oil who were designated among the Hebrews with the name Christ, but also the kings. Uh, fourth century patriarch and theologian Cyril Bishop of Jerusalem wrote, you must know that the chrism is prefigured in the Old Testament when Moses conferring on his brother the divine appointment was ordering him as a high priest. He anointed him, therefore he was called Christ or the anointed one. Um, some have argued uh, that the Johannine anointing, or the anointing which is uh, recorded in the epistle of John, is a figurative anointing, that it wasn't actually an oil anointing, but that it was a, a metaphor for something. Um, the two possibilities are, it was A, a ritual action in which the Johannine Christian was physically anointed, or B, a figurative anointing or illumination. Um, John wrote, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as, even as it has taught you, ye shall abide in him. Um, Raymond Brown, who was a famous uh, John scholar, um, referring to the time Jesus himself was anointed, suggests that it is entirely conceivable that Jesus' followers might have ritually imitated such an anointing, um, just like uh, we ritually imitate his baptism by doing the same thing. Um, which is interesting because... Um, Interesting, it's true because the verbs used in Matthew and Luke to describe Jesus' anointing aren't the same verb which John used to describe the anointing, so maybe it had evolved by them. Um, the, also, the Greek charisma, which can be translated as anointing or unction, uh, can certainly denote the action of a verb. And nouns in Greek ending in the, the letters uh, mu and alpha generally indicate the result of a verbal action. For example, a good example would be um, pragma, which is a thing done and therefore a deed or doing. Uh, chrema, which is a thing said and therefore a saying, and uh, chrisma, which isn't just an anointing but the oil used for an anointing. Uh, therefore, when John wrote the words kai uh, humesto chrisma ho elebata, using the aorist, which is a, a Greek tense of the verb form lambano, uh, he was referring to a specific little oil for the anointing, uh, which had previously taken place, and it wasn't just a uh, figurative thing. Uh, Tertullian. Um, the evidences in the writings of Tertullian are much more prevalent. Um, Tertullian, who wrote in the late 2nd century, early 3rd th centuries, often wrote in response to the misunderstandings or heresies of those whom he, deep, whom he deemed heretics. Uh, it is entirely possible that the issues which he expounded on, namely the physicality of the anointing, its origin and spiritual significance, were somewhat mysterious or unclear in the mind of early Christians. 
and therefore needed some clarification. Uh, Walter Wagner wrote, Tertullian's theology emerged as a coherent response to the challenges that faced the church. Uh, in his treatise on baptism, judging solely from the allusions to the little anointing of Aaron, one can see that he saw the chrism as a physical ritual rather than a fig figurative metaphorical occurrence. He wrote, after that we have come up from the washing and are anointed with the blessed unction, or anointing, um, following that anci ancient practice by which even Aaron, ever since Aaron was anointing by Moses, there was a custom of anointing uh, them for the priesthood with an oil out of a horn. He also wrote that it is the oil which flows on the flesh but profits spiritually in the same way as the act of baptism itself too is carnal in that we are plunged in the water, the effect is spiritual in that we are freed from sins. So essentially the chrism for Tertullian was an actual anointing representing a spiritual thing. Uh, Cyril, who was another Christian uh, father who was the Bishop of Jerusalem, um, wrote the most comprehensive treatise on the, on the chrism. Uh, he also responded to heretical viewpoints that were common among early Christian communities, and he wrote around uh, 347 BC. Um, writing a century later than Tertullian, he unmistakably understood the anointing to be literal and not a figurative one. He both makes allusions to the physical anointings of Aaron and Solomon and goes so far as to name the parts of the body which are to be anointed with the visible oil. Uh, the very fact that he found it necessary to specify that it was a visible oil uh, suggests that uh, this was an issue that needed to be clarified. Um, furthermore, he wrote, You must know that the chrism is prefigured in the Old Testament. When Moses, conferring on his brother a divine appointment, was ordaining him as a high priest, he anointed him. Building off the illusion of the Mosaic anointing, he adds, With this anointment, ointment, your forehead and your sense organs are sacramentally anointed, first upon your forehead, then upon your ears, then on your nostrils, then on the breast. And with that, we see some uh, Latter-day parallels. Uh, in addition, illustrating his literal interpretation, he concluded that the chrism is a heavenly protection of the body and a salvation for the soul. Once again, expressing the, the, the dualistic parallel there. Um, Cyril, like John and Tertullian, taught the chrism included a literal and a physical anointing. Um, the chrism was also a, a symbol for the reception of the Holy Ghost. Uh, like in baptism, we're buried in the water and we come up as if we're cleansed from the water. Um, it's also a, a parallel. <coughs> uh, one of the writings that survived, oh, excuse me. Um, of all three accounts, the chrism shares metaphors and symbols suggesting not just a literal anointing, but a spiritual one. Um, the spiritual aspect of the chrism, which the literal anointing represents, is the reception of the Holy Spirit. Um, though it is not explicit in his epistle, by reading John, 1 John chapter 2 in conjunction with the Gospel of John, one sees the implication for the reception of the Spirit. The first epistle of John is generally accepted to have been written after the Gospel, and therefore an allusion to his previous book would not be unlikely. Um, John mentions the chrism twice in his first epistle, once in verse 20 and once in verse 27. Uh, he writes, And you have received an anointing from the Holy One, or you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. But the anointing which you have received remains in you, and you need not that any man teach you, even as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as, as it has taught you, you abide in him. Uh, he makes obvious reference to the 14th chapter of his gospel, verses 16 and 26. They read, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, so that he remains, in, he remains with you forever. But the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Uh, both texts refer to a knowledge of all things which is acquired by teaching. Uh, in the epistle, it is the anointing which does the teaching, while in the gospel, it is the Holy Spirit. Uh, we see the parallel there. In both instances, the anointing and the Holy Spirit are received by the hand of God and both abide in the individual. Um, John equates the chrism to the reception of the Holy Ghost, which is given by the Father to an individual. Um, in Tertullian, uh, in his description of the chrism, he draws a parallel between the physical oil anointing and the individual being anointed with the Spirit of God um, by the Father. Um, his comparison is to the chrism of Jesus Christ. He writes, This is why the high priest is called Christ, from chrism, which is the Greek for anointing. And from this also our Lord obtained his title, being made spiritual in that he was anointed with the Spirit by the Father, by God the Father. And also, as it says in the Acts, For of a truth they are gathered together in this holy city, pardon, in this city against thy holy Son, whom thou hast anointed. Tertullian interprets Christ's chrism both in a physical and spiritual sense. 
Uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, records the physical anointing of Christ. It reads, There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment, and uh, poured it on his head. Now, um, Luke and Mark differ in this, in that when Christ was anointed in their Gospels, uh, he was anointed on, the, on his feet. Um, the spiritual anointing of Jesus was understood to have taken place after his baptism in the Jordan River. Matthew wrote, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went straightway up out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him and lighting like a dove. And according to Tertullian, this is when he was um, anointed by the Father, and he was anointed with the Spirit. Um, this is the anointing to which Tertullian draws a parallel. Jesus Christ, the Holy Son, was anointed with the Spirit by his Father, and literally by the woman on the head. Essentially what Tertullian is saying is that Jesus obtained the title Christ, or Christos, the Anointed One, by being physically anointed on the head as high priests were in the Old Testament. Um, and he was, this was done by a woman. And then uh, he's also saying he was anointed spiritually and that his Father's Spirit descended on him when he came up out of the waters of baptism in the Jordan River. Um, that was his spiritual anointing. And then he, I quote, So also in our case, the unction flows on the flesh, upon the flesh, but turns to spiritual profit. Um, ergo, spiritual profit is equated to the reception of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, in the writings of Tertullian. Um, the parallels to the reception of the Holy Spirit are likewise plainly spelled out in Cyril's Mystagogical Lecture uh, 3. This was given to uh, new converts who were entering the church. I guess they're... Um, they could be equated to the new member discussions. Um, he wrote, now, have you, now you've become Christ's by, not Christ as in possessing, but Christ as in the plural noun. You've become Christ by receiving the antitype of the Holy Spirit, um, his, his Christ's Father, appointing him Savior of the whole world, appointing him with the Holy Spirit. The spiritual comparison in Cyril's chrism is also that of Christ, who was anointed by, him, by his Father uh, with the Holy Spirit. He wrote, Beware that of supposing that the ointment is mere ointment. The holy, this holy oil, in conjunction with, conjunction with the invocation, is no longer simple or common oil, but becomes the gracious gift of Christ and the Holy Spirit, producing the advent of his deity. Whatever that means. Uh, advent of his deity, I think, yeah, refers to the coming of his, uh, his essence or his holiness. He then continues um, drawing on the language of his apostolic forebearer John, saying, Keep this chrism unsullied or unprofaned, uh, for it shall teach you of all things, if it abide in you, as you have heard the blessed John declaring. Um, a sensible interpretation of Cyril's writing suggests that, just as John and Tertullian, he saw the chrism as a physical anointing with physical oil, uh, but the representation for uh, the reception of the Holy Spirit. Um, last of all, all three examples of the chrism refer to a special endowment of knowledge and power that comes to the anointed. Um, we likewise see this parallel in um, Latter-day Doctrine and Practice. Uh, in each instance, the added gift or power is used to protect the individual in some way from the influence or power of the adversary. Uh, because the chrism is so closely associated with the reception of the Holy Spirit, more often than not, the endowment is but a, spiritual, but a list of spiritual gifts which come from an experience with the Holy Spirit. Uh, in 1 John, his mention of the chrism is introduced by the following verses. He writes, Little children, it is the last time as you have heard that an antichrist shall come. Uh, even now there are many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest, that they were not all of us. Uh, here John is informing the members of the community of the situation at hand. Uh, he tells them that they're in the last times and during which times um, these antichrists will and have emerged already. Uh, then he, he then describes the chrism as a gift by which the anointed ones, or the christianoi, will, might discern between the true followers and the antichrists. Uh, he wrote, but you have a chrisma, or chism, or anointing from the Holy One, um, and you know all things. I have not written you because you know not the truth, but because you know it. But the anointing which you have received remains in you, and you need not that any man teach you, even as the same anointing teaches you of all things. Uh, of all things. Oh, that's my place, sorry. Uh, it teaches you. Even as the same teaches and is truth, and is no lie. <coughs> uh, so their having received the chrism endows them with the knowledge which enables them to distinguish uh, all truth from falsehood. The Antichrist's 
the thing which, uh, which John does not need to teach the anointed one is the fact that there are antichrists and how the faithful can recognize them. He has no need to teach them these things because even the same anointing or the chrism has endowed them with this discerning knowledge. Um, in the writings of Tertullian, uh, he's a little more vague and mysterious in his writings um, as far as his explanation of the spiritual endowment received by the anointing. He simply writes that uh, the individual is made spiritual and a prophet spiritually, just as in baptism itself. Um, uh, in the act that it touches the flesh, that we are immersed in water, but a spiritual effect and that we are set free from sins. Um, he later equates this uh, being made spiritual or profiting spiritually, not only with the Holy Ghost, uh, but with um, receiving attributes of um, simplicity and innocence and uh, the peace of God sent out from the heavens. Uh, in opposition to the carnal man, Tertullian's chrism endows the um, anointed one with a, uh, the attributes of Christ. Cyril uh, once again gives the most in-depth description of the effects of the chrism. He recounts each part of the body on which an individual would be anointed and the corresponding spiritual endowment he or she would receive. Um, first was the forehead to rid you of the shame which the first human transgressor bore. Then the ears to receive ears quick to hear the divine mysteries. Third was the nostrils that smelling the divine oil you may say we are the incense offered by God by Christ to God, uh, in the case of those who are on the way to salvation. And last, on the breast, that putting on the breastplate of justice, you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. Um, like his progenitors, Cyril described the uh, chrism as endowing the individual with spiritual cleanliness, knowledge, and added protecting against the power of the devil. Uh, in conclusion, one can see that throughout history, of the early Christian church, the chrism was widely understood to contain these three important themes. As time went on, Christian writers would expound on these principles, progressively becoming more descriptive in their treatises. Um, this suggests that perhaps a response, this suggests perhaps a response to misunderstandings or perversions of the practice, uh, or maybe it was simple, it was simply an attempt to educate the assembly concerning something uh, which was somewhat of a mystery to them. Whatever the case may have been during the first four centuries of the Christian history, uh, the ritual was intended to be understood as a literal anointing, a symbol for the reception of the Holy Spirit, and a spiritual endowment of knowledge and power. Um.